Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of BSN's A Long Story Short. Today's topic covers an important dilemma in the technological development of blockchains. They were designed to be transparent. However, in the real world, not everything is meant to be completely visible to the prying eye. That's why Zero Knowledge Proofs, a technology that reveals some information without revealing all the juicy details, is so crucial to advancing the use of blockchains in real world applications. To enlighten me on this topic, we are joined by three experts, Kyle from Provide, Rob from Horizon Labs, and Ifan from Red Date Technology. Uh, before we begin, there's a reminder that in the description below, you can find all the information, such as the Twitter at BSM Base, or you can search on LinkedIn and view on our website. All right, so let's give the panelists a chance to share their backgrounds, uh, including how they were led to their involvement within their respective organizations. I feel it always helps to give a little bit of context. So Rob, why don't we kick things off with you? Sure. Yeah, my name is Rob Viglione. I am the CEO of Horizon Labs and co-founder of Horizon, the public blockchain network. Uh, my background before that was really in the hard sciences, physics, mathematics. Then I ended up with my PhD in finance, of all things. But I think economics helps out a lot with these decentralized networks. Our project is, is really specializing, has been specializing for the last several years in zero-knowledge cryptography. In particular, we, we use it for data privacy. So you, you could put a whole bunch of information on a blockchain without revealing that information, which we think is that missing link to get blockchains to scale. And also security. It's a really important security aspect where we use snarks for interchain communications. Excellent. Kyle, why don't we send it over to you? Uh, tell us a little bit about this, the same thing. Sure. So uh, um, I'm Kyle Thomas, uh, founder and CEO of Provide. Uh, Provide I started Provide to... Um, Give organizations, uh, you know, a, a way to um, to access blockchain in an agnostic way. Um, uh, I started provide um, back in 2017, uh, and it's evolved. Um, you know, first from sort of like a just just an agnostic uh, uh, web three Swiss Army knife uh, into um, sort of a full stack enterprise uh, uh, layer two that um, that you can run. Uh, in a privacy preserving way uh, to, to really um, uh, give organizations a, um, you know, a way to run workflows uh, with their counterparties uh, in a way where the data, data can stay where it lives. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's an exciting space. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, humbled to be, uh, to be here today. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, a man who doesn't really need an introduction on this show uh, because he's a frequent speaker, but we'll let him give a short one anyway. Yifan, why don't you uh, let the audience know a little bit more about yourself? Okay, uh, my name is Yifan He, and uh, I'm the CEO of Ready uh, Tech. And uh, Ready is one of the founding member of uh, blockchain-based uh, service network, ISPSN. So uh, today, I basically come here to learn. Okay, because I firmly <laughs> believe zero knowledge proof it will be a major part of the new internet. So, so that's why I come here to learn and pretending, you know. Have understand this without revealing I have zero knowledge on zero knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like usually when we get topics about a certain application and it's like, okay, I got this, right? But uh, with this, it tends to be a little bit more academical or academic, sorry. And uh, uh, with, you know, what is zero knowledge proofs in simple terms? Does anyone have, uh, does anyone want to take the lead on that one? I mean, oh, I, you can, jump I, on can that? Throw, yeah, I can throw like an example. Sure. Um, so uh, we've been kicking around an idea uh, to, to maybe create uh, some sort of like a hello world for ZKPs um, mm -hmm. and in a way where folks can understand it. And uh, to us, maybe that, that looks like a, a poker game where you it's like a Texas Hold'em game where you don't have to show your cards ever. Um, you could, you know, someone won, the, won every hand, but, you know, no one has to show their cards. Uh, it's kind of an interesting use case in, in Hello World, potentially. So um, maybe that, that helps folks understand it. Yeah, in, in, uh, for me, what makes it, or at least where I came into the ZKP world, was on the uh, coin transfer privacy. And this is where ZKPs were first used in, in blockchain networks. So it was really on privacy for transferring value. And just, I, I think, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense to think about this. I could send you know, Ben money, I guess, and send Ben, let's send Zen some Zen, send, send Ben some Zen, because that's what we do, right? <laughs> and we, we can post a transaction to the network, or I, I can broadcast a transaction to the network, 
And all the network would see is that a valid transaction has occurred because there's a, you know, a zero knowledge proving circuit within the software of this blockchain network. And that circuit just enforces the rules of the game here. So consensus in this game. So consensus will check a number of things to make sure they're valid. And if they're valid, if like a Boolean circuit will pass the output to say, this is a valid transaction. And that valid transaction in our case would be Rob has, you know, X amount of Zen and I'm sending it to a valid Zen address. Uh, and it, you know, it passes just every every aspect of then of, of the blockchain circuit. So valid proof of work, uh, in our case, proof of work, and in other cases, maybe proof of stake, but whatever checks you have for your consensus have been met. And then publicly, the only thing you'll see is, you know, some kind of like, uh, you know, null null out transaction. Something occurred that was valid. The network verified that it was valid, but you don't see exactly what it is. On your end, then you're going to actually see that that X amount of Zen pop into your your uh, you know uh, your Zen address in your wallet, and, and and then it's done. Now, what we're doing is we're taking it way beyond the concept of just coin transfer. For us, it's all about data privacy and thinking about arbitrary data structures because there's so much more that you want to do with this blockchain technology other than just send coins back and forth, right? That, that's a huge use case. Bitcoin tackles it. On the privacy side, there are a variety of other you know, players that tackle it very well, from Zcash to Monero and you know, others in, in that segment of the market. We're really focusing on taking blockchain to enterprise use cases for things that solve real business problems. And here you can think of a simple example that might explain it is like an invoicing uh, use case. So a digital invoicing. I want to, I'm a merchant and I want to, be able to you know, publish the time series of my merchant my, my transactions with my vendors onto a public ledger because I want to prove to the world that I'm a good credit quality. I actually pay my bills on time. I have all of these vendors, they're, they're servicing me and we have all these different flow, uh, fund flows going back and forth. I don't want the world to see all of these fund flows. I don't want the world to see, especially my competitors, all of the vendors that comprise my network that help me get my good or service to market but I want to prove to the world that I am good credit quality. I'm actually paying my bills on time. So this is where zero knowledge proofs and like a, an arbitrary data construct work really well. It's we can actually publish or broadcast digital invoice data to a blockchain network, obscuring the, the data using uh, zero knowledge proofs so that we can actually still validate valid transactions hit the network, but we don't reveal the underlying data to the network. Now, on the other end, people that might want to make use of this information say, a hedge fund in New York that wants to factor invoices. So they want to finance invoices. So if Walmart owes some vendor in Mexico, you know, X amount of dollars uh, or, or pay Mexican peso uh, by some, some certain days, say it's a 90 day invoice, rather than waiting that 90 days to collect from Walmart, that company could actually factor the invoice or finance the invoice with a hedge fund in New York that goes and pays 90 cents on the dollar or 90, 90, 90 uh, peso, 90 cents on the peso to get money in the hands of the merchant right away. And the way they do this is they can look at proofs on the network and, and the proof would be, is, is this, um, do, does this vendor pay? And, and you can kind of construct what you're looking for, but at the end of the day is, does this vendor pay its bills on time? And we have proofs of that without actually seeing any of that underlying data. I know that's kind of a long story, but again, going down the analogy path, I think really paints a, a good picture. It started with coin transfer, but you know, really now what we're doing is we're, we're solving a whole bunch of business problems on blockchains using this technology. Yeah, yeah so I, I, th I think that really helps. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, you mentioned both, the, both of you guys are more on the enterprise side, but I feel like from uh, anyone who's interacted with DeFi, uh, you know, they've experienced kind of the over collateralization used to take a loan, right? I mean, we can see this also coming to a, a more retail facing where people have like credit scores and things without actually revealing all their data to these decentralized protocols that they interact with. Uh, Ifan, we, did you, did you want to add anything on here? I know you have yeah, some, some good analogies uh, stored up. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, uh, personally, uh, I mean, like I discussed before, the way we see the blockchain technology is a way to new way to communicate more, you know, uh, much more efficient way to communicate. So personally, I still think the we we should uh, see the zero knowledge proof as a, a, a new way, part of new way to communicate data. But basically, uh, right now, no matter it's on internet or, or phone or you know even face to face, when I need a proof something I I know, 
I basically need to tell them why I know. So they know I know. So now there's some scenarios is I need them to know I know, but I don't review why I know. So how you handle that right now? It, it, it's actually pretty com complicated process to do that because also you are not only proof that to, uh, to the other party, you sometimes there's bystanders. You have to prove to them, not you, two of you guys basically run scan. <laughs> so, so, so <laughs> it's actually is very complicated. I, I, I think it's much deeper, you know, technology to communicate another layer of data. So this is very, very fundamental, very, very fundamental technology mm -hmm. for the next like 50 years. Can I just strongly agree with Yifan here? It, we actually, I talked about the data privacy structures that, that we have you know, with our technology, but fundamentally it is, it, it enables much deeper communication protocols. And we're, we're implementing that right now with a side chain. So a main chain and side chain architecture, like in our system um, that we're releasing in October, you, you can have up to a thousand blockchains operating in parallel with the main, the main, main blockchain. And the way that they communicate with each other, the way they guarantee security between each of the side chains is with zero knowledge proofs. So in order to make this type of system scale where you have so many blockchains running in parallel with each other, you don't want one of these chains or the nodes on, on this network to have to follow all of the operations, all the consensus, all the transactions, validate everything for all of these different blockchains. What we do is we actually package transactions into you know, blocks and blocks into epics. And then we send certificates that comprise proofs, zero knowledge proofs from each of the transactions aggregated, aggregated up into each, each of the blocks and epics. And then the, the main blockchain only sees the, the certificates or the zero knowledge proofs, the aggregates or um, ZKPs that are sent back from the side chain. So at the end of the day, you can think of this as strictly, in this sense, a communication protocol between chains. And this unlocks so much more value. Absolutely. Interesting. Uh, I, you know, it's, it, it, what's really interesting about, about the ZKPs and the enterprise space is no one um, has ever really uh, done any um, ERP synchronization in the past. Like, how, how have ERP systems not, like, talked to one another before? Uh, I think it's because, we're you know, we're missing this fundamental link, uh, you know, and, and ZKPs and, and roll-ups, uh, you know, to your point, uh, you know, really enabling that. I think it's very exciting. Yeah, that's great. I think it would really help all of us uh, and the listeners, especially to have some more context, maybe on what your 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 companies do in this space. Um, maybe Kyle, you could start by talking about provide with provide what sort of mm -hmm. you know customer use uh, service and like what what do the, these use cases look like? Yeah, so, so like uh, one of the flagship ones that that we we like to talk about is is uh, Coke One North America. Um, so the ecosystem operator. Uh, we, we like to look at this all, you know, this this market as sort of uh, an ecosystem uh, and transformative opportunity for ecosystems. Um, and so, if you look at Coke One North America as an ecosystem, uh, they they represent um, they're they're an IT services provider for Coke. Uh, they they have twelve of the largest uh, largest bottlers in North America. Uh, they represent ninety five percent of of the North American uh, bottling supply chain for Coke. And um, you know that ecosystem. You know they they run SAP like they provide an SAP multi tenant SAP environment for um, for bottlers and then uh, you know the procure to pay process uh, you know today you know prior to the baseline protocol and, and provide so provide is the uh, is the is the standard implementation or the reference implementation uh, that's driving the standard I should say for for baseline and um, you know it's really uh, presents this you know open and inclusive sort of um, Network for for uh, for bottlers and suppliers to uh, to do business like they're already doing today, but uh, but enables this zero knowledge this this concept of zero knowledge and, and sort of arbitrary data uh, so that so that you you know the, the procure to pay process is um, you know sort of interleaved. It's meaning um, you know you have you have a, a, a purchase order, sales order, a shipment notification, a goods receipt, and then an invoice. Um, you know, and, and there's some micro steps along the way. That, but if you interleave this process with, with zero knowledge circuits, um, you know, you, you get this the high fidelity invoice uh, that comes out on the other side uh, that you can then under zero knowledge, um, you know, aggregate off chain with with a bunch of other invoice proofs, if you will. So, you, have, you know, a, a bunch of different processes can complete 
uh, and you, if you can roll, the, roll those proofs up into a single, uh, what's called a, Z, a ZK roll-up proof. Um, and then you could, you know, depending on how you do that and where you do that, like maybe you do it off-chain, um, and then you can you can sort of aggregate those proofs of proofs into a single proof. So you have a ZK, ZK roll-up proof that uh, makes its way to the public blockchain. Um, and then you can do all sorts of in, uh, interesting uh, DeFi sort of stuff um, you know, in, in terms of uh, what, resem- what largely resembles factoring, but in a, in a much more efficient way. Excellent. Uh, and what about you, Rob? Yeah, so Horizon Labs at, at the core of our business could be considered a zero knowledge circuit building company. So that, that's really what we specialize in. We have a, a great crypto team that just every day focuses on different types of proof structures, proofing systems, circuits so that we can enable different types of things. The things that we enable are like blockchain infrastructure and blockchain tools. So like at the, the core level, you could say we're a circuit building company at the broader level where a blockchain company providing a whole bunch of services and infrastructure to the industry. We, we're a spinoff from the Horizon blockchain uh, network. So really we're building this whole suite of tools and the protocol at Horizon really, really to scale out that infrastructure. So we're very much focusing on scaling blockchain infrastructure largely to enterprise clients and largely to bigger use cases that we think solve some of you know, the, the biggest problems of the market and, and for society using this technology. Uh, Ethan, I guess your, your involvement would be more academic. Is, is that right in thinking that? Or are you actually actively working on some ZK uh, uh, ap- applications? Actually, it's uh, you know uh, BSN uh, infrastructure. That's uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, for this way. Uh, uh, proof of uh, uh, privacy computing will be become a major part of the IT industry in China. Why? Because September first, uh, the new data security law will be in, in fact. So so uh, inside that new data security law, there's two things. One thing they need, uh, you know, all the IT system need to protect the personal data. At all cost, if if you leak your customers' personal data, you know you you probably can go to jail. The second thing actually is um, uh, 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 when the data uh, generates inside China get cross border, then it become a problem. It need uh, you know go through the you know some kind of regulation and get a, a permission. That's so that actually in fact a lot of IT systems. <laughs> When they communicate with outside uh, 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 IT system, sometimes they need to send the, you know their custom personal data to their like travel agencies, banks, stuff. Now it could break the law. So that's actually where we really need in China the zero knowledge, you know, proofed kind of technology. They can you know send the result to their counterparty outside China, but they cannot access the original data. So, so the, 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 this industry will boom in the next two years in China. So that, that's why I'm extremely <laughs> interested. <laughs> and also, uh, also, actually, uh, there's a new project that uh, we will launch that by end of this, uh, this month, actually. Uh, we are building, uh, 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 there's a, 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 a cross-border trade network between Shenzhen government and uh, Singapore government. So, so now it's a, a private BSN is selected as a, as a, as the infrastructure. So, I mean, uh, there we actually need to build in some components to make sure the Chinese data, the trade data, actually goes through everything, reach the IT system in in Singapore, but they get the results, but not the whole data. So, actually, we need that right now. <laughs> so that's why also <laughs> that's why in the past two months we are talking with Rob and Kyle <laughs> trying to figure out how to structure that within BSN. So eventually developers can use this technology to build their applications. Yeah, that brings us to a really important point, I guess, about you know, when you're when you're dealing with enterprises, like how much is this zero knowledge proof like a nice luxury that you might have, and how much of it is like a complete necessity? Uh, you know. Is that been like a big stopping point up until now uh, on, with in terms of anonymous, anonymous uh, privacy of data uh, and this sort of thing? I mean, I'll say it's, you know, it's an absolute requirement um, when you're talking mm-hmm. about, um, you know, going into the enterprise and, and you're talking about, you know, sensitive, sensitive uh, transaction data uh, between parties. You, you can't just 
put that data on the public network. Uh, you have to, but you want you want the proofs on a, to be put on the public network so that you can actually uh, you can do financial things with it, right? Um, and so it, it really it's it's super critical. Uh, and also, um, if you do if you construct these proofs the right way, uh, you can see like you know a single uh, zk zk rollup proof that I mentioned earlier that contains you know many thousand invoice proofs for you know for example uh, with recursive verification. Uh, you could you could really you could really see like um, sort of a mix uh, for, for, from different organizations in, like in the sing, in, a, in the same stream. Uh, and so that really enables, you know, not only the financial aspects uh, in a private way, but also scalability uh, from a tech, you know, from a technology, the technology standpoint as well. So I think it's uh, super critical, and uh, it is very exciting that that it's, uh, you know, the state of the art is is uh, has progressed to the point that it is where we can actually, uh, do practical things uh, for the enterprise. Rob, anything to add there? I'll just say I'm, I'm super biased, and I hundred percent agree with Kyle. Uh, so I think this is absolutely critical to get to get blockchain to scale outside of just the, the kind of niche market that we've been in for the last 10 years, really on the, the cryptocurrency side and then these other applications that are scaling outside of the, you know, the original niche, you know, things like DeFi and everything that that enables and NFTs. There's a lot going on, a lot of innovation, and it is scaling up. But when we talk about enterprise use cases and starting to translate a lot of what happens in the IT domain for businesses out there that are not part of the, this crypto world? It, ZKPs, I think, right now are the focus of where I, I think it's obvious the industry needs to go to be able to get information on chain so that you can do useful things like Kyle said. You can actually do financing operations. You can do other types of proofs and verifications that you might want to do to unlock value for your firm, but you don't want to give away that sensitive information. And in many cases, you legally can't give away that sensitive information, right? But in other cases, it's proprietary and you just don't want to give it away. There's a really great mix here where the industry needs to go in the ZKP direction. And I think that, you know, a handful of players are really positioning themselves to scale up uh, very well right now. Does changing like regulations and guidelines, does it, does it force you guys to kind of uh, innovate faster on this front? And, and do you think it'll be a point where, you know, after you've gotten to a certain point, the regulations continue to change and then forces the technology to continue evolving? Or do you feel like it's once we get this zero knowledge proofs, then we're kind of set, we can do whatever we want? And I'll say uh, regulatory or changing regulatory environment is really lighting a fire under our butts, mm -hmm. but we are really constrained. So we're constrained where there's only so many PhD cryptographers in the world or cryptographic engineers, and we're trying to soak up as many as we can as fast as we can. But it's really hard to, to to grab that type of talent. It is such a specialized niche right now. Now, you know, the way that, it, that these cycles work is you invest heavily in this niche. The world realizes that this is the way that you have to go. And all of a sudden, you know, that investment sparks more people, more expertise to come in. We're learning, we're scaling, but I think our biggest bottleneck is really on the human talent side. And now, I, I mean, uh, uh, blockchain technology is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new, you know, technology. I mean, in China, outside the crypto world, very few people really understand what blockchain is. Now, <laughs> there's no knowledge <laughs> proof. <laughs> I haven't met one person can clearly <laughs> explain that to me. Okay, yeah. and and we, we uh, uh, as uh, as the operator of BSN, you know, ready, you know, uh, we un I actually understand the blockchain technology well. Well, uh, I can, you know, uh, any any protocol I go there, go through, you know, uh, half hour documentation, I basically get the idea. I actually in past one week, I read some paper on zero knowledge proof. I have no idea what they say. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is really, really, really hard. Eh? Uh, especially when you when you really want to achieve some kind of universal solution to that. It's actually in each unique case you need uh, some kind of you know uh, uh, algorithm. Basically, uh, you know how to how to how to solve that. So so it's it's so so hard to understand. So I, I think there's probably very small group of people who can really work on a solution. And also it's, it's, uh, um, need to be as universal as possible. So, so other developers and, and, and people can just plug in and use that technology. This is definitely, yeah. uh, I always say the blockchain technology eventually will become a common 
technology. Any developer need to understand can use immediately, but not their knowledge proof technology. Okay, you need a special group of people and the companies to develop the tools and, and, and the solutions and other people without really understanding everything. But you know, plug in, get results, that's it. So this is really high tech. Totally. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so and there's so many trade-offs to building, right? Like the scalability trade-offs and it, like the decisions you have to make uh, around the technology itself. Uh, to your point, um, it, it makes it very nuanced, uh, and it, it yeah, it's very niche uh, at this point. Like that's why it's exciting to build tools, right? That are that are uh, sort of enabling this this new new paradigm uh, in a way that that will scale. Um, it, uh, again, I, I say this; it's very exciting times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I imagine like for from an face, enterprise facing perspective, when you know you finally, after the last three years, you finally got them to accept blockchain, right? Uh, they understand the technology and they're ready to put it into action. And, and then suddenly you're trying to explain zero knowledge proofs. Is this like another barrier that you have to go through of explaining it, or you know, are people now more aware of the technology? Do you do you feel like this adoption phase is going faster now? Uh, oh, ben, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, fine. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, ben, uh, uh, I think it's like this. It's uh, uh, for blockchain technology, uh, most people have no idea how to use that without cryptocurrency. So mm-hmm. if they want to adopt that into enterprise, it's really hard to explain how they can adopt that. But for zero knowledge proof, it's, it's very easy to explain why they need it. Everybody understand that, but then nobody understands how to achieve that. <laughs> so that's 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 <laughs> what prevented from the blockchain technology. Is nobody knows how to use it, but uh, everybody can 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 see that. And uh, for zero knowledge proof, everybody understands how that important, but nobody knows how to do it. It's it's even their you know uh, uh, CIO CTOs they do some research have no idea how to do it. And I, we want to make it so they don't have to know, right? The, 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 there's just a way for, for audits to happen and then for them to understand that, that it's been done correctly. Um, but really, like, just let's, let's let them continue to focus on their business, right? Yeah, I was going to say, if uh, we ever have to explain what a ZKP is to a client, we, we need to fire our product managers. So, uh, or, or maybe fire me. But, I, I mean, really, <laughs> this technology should be, should be abstracted away and, you should just see the benefits of it. And of course, like we, we do everything right now in the open source uh, software domain, e- even stuff that we retain uh, you know, proprietary IP around, we still open the code base up so that people can verify everything that, that goes into it. I think that's a key element here. And there's probably no wonder why ZKPs are coming out of the open source world is because it is a black box. And if you just have to trust, you know, what's coming out of a black box for, you know, verifying something, how can you do that? Like you really need that type of transparency to make privacy work, which is kind of the, the interesting, uh, you know, um, you flip that around uh, philosophically. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of like one of those things where w- when you first touch blockchain, you, you, the, you're able to go look at the ledger through like a block explorer and you can see everything. And so then it makes sense, right? This is, this is all there. It's immutable. Great. Uh, but now it's, you, you know, you're flipping it, you're making it more deeper. And, and suddenly, like when you're using some layer two solution, like you mentioned earlier, like a ZK rollup, and you have no idea where the transactions are happening and how to, to verify them. So, uh, yeah, I guess there's a, a new emphasis put on the technology itself, which I, I guess brings me to like my, my next question, which is like, where where are we in the, the ZK rollup development phase? Like, is this something that we can go out and see now? Um in the real business world, or is this something that's still more theoretical at this point? Uh, yeah, I'll say I mean, we're, we're bringing uh, ZK rollups and, and uh, recursive snarks uh, into production uh, mm-hmm. in some re- really large organizations. Uh, it is it, the state of the art is, you know, is, is it, it is ca- uh, possible to run this in production today. Uh, and, and we are doing that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just really cool because, you know, you, you see uh, organizations like, like Rob's, uh, I think there's a really cool opportunity to collaborate there. Uh, we're, we're, we're really trying to standardize the interaction and the APIs uh, for developers so they don't really have to, so even developers don't have to know the inner workings of how, how this stuff works. Um, they can just leverage, for example, um, you know, circuits that are, that are you know, built, built for a specific purpose uh, for their use cases and, you know, call, call a REST API, you know, to, to make it all work. Um, yeah, it's 
my, my two cents there. Yeah, and we're all uh, just kind of augment that a little bit is the state of the technology. So it, it, it is production ready now. And for, in our case, for instance, we're on a test net. So we're, we're, we're not, not quite at, at Kyle's uh, you know, point with it, I mean, plugging it to enterprise in production, but the, it's still bespoke. So when we solve, we, like I said, we're a circuit building company. And when we solve a particular business problem, we're generally writing a circuit specific to that problem. This doesn't scale very well. Like we, we don't want to go out there and solve all of the world's problems one circuit at a time. Still, like that's not the way it's going to go. It, it looks like that right now. And this is the way that uh, industries typically evolve is you start with the bespoke solutions. You get really good at them. Our engineers, our cryptographers now are doing more general purpose circuits to do more general purpose things. And from the developer's perspective, you know, we're, we're going to release a circuit that it has some product out there that then developers can write smart contracts on top of it and they can start customizing and tailoring things, but the core of it is kind of a standardized uh, ZKP circuit. Now, there are groups that are looking at generalizing the circuit production itself. And this would, I would say the next step for the industry is we have to make the circuits themselves dynamic because as an example, like when, when we do, like we, we can enable blockchains that can do a lot of deterministic types of functions. You know, you can generate your NFT, you can you know, do some sort of like token swap things that are deterministic in nature. But as soon as you go into more of like a, a virtual machine-based smart contracting language where it, it's more dynamic and developers have the flexibility to create dynamic structures, SNARKs, as an example, like a, a particular like ZKP class, uh, um, it is, is not suited well because you have to actually code these things in, you know, ex ante into the circuit. Where we need to go next as an industry is like dynamic circuits so that we can actually... Uh, encode dynamic data structures and make and add more flexibility for developers. We can't do that yet as an industry. There are people focusing on that problem. That'll be the next major breakthrough, I think, as an industry when we actually solve that problem. But right now, we're still in the early stages where you have companies like mine, companies like Kyle's that are actually doing more bespoke work that we want to generalize more. But really, every new problem, we're, we're writing a new circuit to solve that problem. And we need to ultimately get away from that. I have no doubt we will. We're investing heavily in human capital and IP. So we'll get there. Yeah, and and uh, uh, as a BSN, actually, we are exploring to integrating some kind of privacy computing technology uh, onto BSN. So we are actually testing uh, um, right now the way back. Uh, they have a solution. So, so we, uh, we, we, we integrate into uh, our BSN and uh, we, we do some very simple, you know, uh, uh, computing and the transaction. It seems, it seems works. Okay. Basically, is there's a raw data. Then you have, you know, something you need to compute the raw data and get the results. So, but uh, uh, all the raw data is uh, belong to a third party and they encrypt it. So go through that without reviewing what the raw data is. You can compute. Uh, you can do the computing and get a result you want. Okay, so 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 right now it's so complicated. We can only do some, you know, compare which number is bigger and then the, do a sorting. You know, which come first, second. <laughs> I say, okay, this is interesting. This works, but uh, hi. <laughs> Everything I know, every business transaction I know is much complicated than this. <laughs> How we achieve that? <laughs> There's a long, long, long way to go. So that's why it's, uh, you know, uh, zero knowledge proof is the first step. And for privacy computing, it involves much more different, uh, you know, difficult scenarios. You know, if there's a, a bunch, like 100 different agreements, without reading the agreement content, you get some kind of result from this this bunch of agreements then do an action based on the result. That will take an AI, <laughs> that will take a lot of things putting together to achieve that. Right? So right now, I think uh, the technology is, uh, is, uh, is already in production, but there's still a long way, long way to go. Uh, Robert, yeah, Kyle, anything stop. to add on to that? I would say it's just, it's just about making it easier, um, making it more dynamic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've been we've been working on uh, uh, sort of like this workflow modeler, this this no code workflow modeler uh, that on the back end allow you know sort of sort of does uh, circuit uh, circuit generation. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's certainly an interesting uh, interesting opportunity. Um, you know, to, to to think about how you, how you how one might model their business process. Uh, without any code and then you know behind the scenes 
um, some some circuits. So currently, we're we're doing code generation. Um, you know, it, it's it still it still looks a little a little bespoke, right? Because we we are doing code gen behind the scenes there. Um, but I mean, it's a start. Interesting. Uh, I mean, everyone's mentioning the like the the resources. Uh, the real barrier is like the the researchers who are developing this. Uh, Rob mentioned earlier the people with the PhDs in cryptography. How how big of a you know a handful of people are actually working on this right now? Um, it, yeah, I guess that would be my first question. Then is you know how like how, what is the talent pool that is that is driving this uh, technology there's, forward? There's there's all of six people working on. It. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> are they in the room right now? <laughs> the, 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 you know what I'll say is the, the Ethereum community. The Ethereum community, uh, you know, I, I think is is has really uh, stepped up in a big way. Um, you know, Zcash. As well, you know, the, 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 those couple of a couple of a uh, couple of developers, at least uh, from those communities, you know, are, are really stepped up, and I, you know, I think the, that it's um, yeah, the, those communities are really uh, leading the way in many ways. Yeah, in, in one uh, barometer of this, there's a really a phenomenal podcast called the Zero Knowledge Podcast. If, if you guys check that out, just the if you've been following it over the years, and you can look at the stream of different interviews that they do, the the types of things that ZK you know, experts are building now or trying to build has really just skyrocketed. So that's just a really nice barometer to look at. There's a lot more talent in this space now. Now, in terms of like, we, we, we all have different segments of, of the industry that we're working on. So it's hard to have full visibility. I mean, but literally there's probably hundreds of deep experts with maybe PhD level experts in the industry, maybe flanked from there with hundreds, maybe low level thousands of cryptographic engineers or engineers that are really like mm-hmm. specialized in grabbing standardized crypto libraries and deploying technology in, in the segment. So really like it's that's a really small segment of the industry that, mm-hmm. that are capable people that, that are there now. Now as we standardize these things and, and we we you know wrote a crypto lib ourselves called Ginger Lib and this is nice a nice standardized library that other engineers can come in and start grabbing gadgets and tools so that they can write their own circuits. But the, the specialized ability to be able to write your own circuit is still like there's a high high barrier for that. I do I do predict that over time, like what happens with every industry, it will be more as more standardized tools are released and it becomes easier to write these types of circuits. As more employees come in and get trained, as more developers going through universities realize there's an opportunity here. As more university departments have their ZKP experts funded with grants, like there, there's a process here that takes time that really does explode. You know, as much as you can, and, and this this niche explode the, the human talent that that you know is part of it. So I'm hopeful, and I think we're going to get there, and I think we're going to get there a lot quicker than many people realize just by looking at the current state of the industry. Mm-hmm. If and maybe you could talk a little bit about like development in China. It, I'd be curious because a lot of technologies out there right now they're developing kind of in parallel with the Chinese, you know, universities and governments and uh, state-owned enterprises going on one direction, um, and then obviously more like the Western, maybe uh, cyberpunk type people who are working on these other technologies over there. Uh, is this the same with zero knowledge proofs? Uh, so far, I haven't seen many. Uh, you know, even in the universities, uh, uh, many teams are mm-hmm. working on this. I, I haven't really seen uh, much. There's, uh, you know, so, some professor is uh, working on this. I talk to them. It's uh, uh, still in China. You know, sometimes we actually focus on the application side, not deep down the, the research and, uh, you know, the, 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 the underlying technology side. So, uh, so far, I, uh, personally, I don't. I don't think there are so many people in China really working on, you know, underlying it's technology. Uh, but uh, but there's a lot of user cases and and uh, some tools built based on some open source components. You know, to uh, in China definitely. But personally, I really really think this is uh, you know, almost all the people doesn't really understand how important this is. Okay. The one thing, uh, uh, personally, I think this is to, could be like in 10 years. I mean, eventually on the internet, we never review our personal information. Okay. Why we even need to put in a zip code there to, to make a payment? We shouldn't. Uh, why I need, when I register some website, I need to put my name there. I mean, by law, if it doesn't require KYC, why even put in the name? So there should be something inside our computer or in the future, some kind of personal 
data center, okay, virtual data center. So everything need to go through it, and then the you know the uh, 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 all the personal information stored in my device, in my data center, and the, and the, and the, you know after a comp computing process, I only push out the results. So and that result should be trustworthy and very ver uh, ver verifiable by the government and any third parties. And that should be the, what the internet looks like. Not now. Now it's basically we are naked and running around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't think, matter what. Cre creating. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Kyle. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, creating standards, developing these as standards uh, that we can deploy together, um, you know, it really makes a lot of sense, um, you know, and all the talent working together on those standards, uh, it is going to get here fast mm -hmm. for, main, yeah. for mainstream adoption. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I was just going to add on to it. It doesn't matter like what question I ask Ethan, he always seems to lead me to the next point, which was about the social side, right? We've talked about like the, the regulatory compliance side pushing the technology, but how important to the social side is zero knowledge proofs? I mean, uh, one topic that we're seeing a lot of like CBDCs where suddenly like finance might be exposed into a more public or maybe not public, maybe like a centralized entity would have access to a lot of information that maybe you wouldn't necessarily want them having access to. Um, so, so where do you see this going from a social side? Uh, maybe Kyle or Rob, if you want to sound off on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think Yvonne was sort of hinting at it. Uh, you could certainly, um, you know, use ZKPs for a much more robust self-sovereign identity. That's absolutely a thing. And, and I would just say the process would be kind of like an anatomization of, of data on, on the web. So rather than having large you know, commercial entities that control all this information, you decentralize that. And you allow individuals to really retain that information themselves and then, of course, you know, governments that, that are managing you know, large, large amount, like big processes will be able to verify all this information. So as long as we kind of decentralize it where individuals have ownership, now this could actually unlock really interesting social and economic processes at that point, because we've hit a, a weird, a really good, weird intersection where um for for you know decades, there was kind of a trickle of information being generated by people, and this information then kind of w was starting to be collected and used to say, as an example, train machine learning processes. And then all of a sudden, the, these NL and AI processes that are ingesting this information became really valuable, and you know, really from like the social networking, the marketing domains became really valuable. And then companies, entire industries were built around information that was being generated and dispensed for free. If we flip this around, we anatomize the process, decentralize it so that individuals control their own information and can selectively choose what information, if any, gets revealed to the public. You know, now they can be the ones that can potentially harvest the economic value of this information. Now, this is really powerful. This could make anyone in the world, you know, have like a de facto subsidy or of economic value that they can capture just by existing, just by participating in, in different uh you know, games and social media platforms and, you know, online you know, like e-commerce, whatever processes you're participating in, you know, you're creating value. So I, I, I could not be more excited and bullish for this type of technology. I do think that at the end of the day, it's going to be greatly facilitated and enabled with ZKPs because we're going to want a, a kind of a class of crypto that's going to allow people to retain this private information, but still make use of it in the public domain. And, and that's ZKPs bread and butter. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. I I, I think uh, you know this along with uh, central bank digital currency is two major measures. I mean, central bank digital currency is like uh, you know uh, now the old way we give the money to the bank. They give me a virtual account. Say, oh, there's so many money in there. No, actually, they move my money to give the company for loans. So so for CDBC, the major thing is uh, we we no longer give everything controlled by the big corporation. We actually own the account directly with central bank and we own the money. If the corporation wants to get my money, pay a higher rate, then, you know, provide some, you know, good services, then I can give you my money to control by you and, and to manage it. So, so this is actually for CBDC. Actually, you, you give the rights of the money back to yourself. Same thing as the information. Okay. With the, uh, with the privacy computing, zero knowledge proof, it basically you give me back my information, my privacy. If you want 
my, my information, I give you results. You never can reach this. Actually, no matter uh, central bank digital currency, zero knowledge proof, it actually gives the individual more power over big corporations, even governments. So this is actually definitely the future. Just remember, when, when we have no IT system, how people socialize, they meet each other, you know, then you build a different industry, bars, restaurants, you know, around that. Then we have internet. Then you build the industry around how people meeting each other socially. You know, there's e-commerce, there's Twitter, there everything. Just remember when we get back our information, how we socialize. Yeah. That's I think it's all <laughs> yeah, entire new industry. Okay. Yeah. It's also is this you know this access to this open uh, and inclusive ecosystem uh, is is really driving or I think can can you know in the coming years will really be be shown to drive a new a new level of financial inclusivity for for these people as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, without our personal information, sometimes people trade are traded more equally. Okay, <laughs> more equally. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the hour. Um, so I, I want to ask one or two more questions while we have time and have everyone on the line because I feel like the conversation is producing some pretty interesting storylines. Uh, I, I am kind of curious if everyone's working towards standardizations and a lot of the, the development is being driven by, you know, a, a few key, like the Ethereum Foundation at the top, you know, like how do you structure your companies? I guess this is a good one for Rob and Kyle to have some unique selling point. Is it just about getting something to a, you know, the, the middleware phase faster, um, or, or is there something else there? Kyle, do you want to you take that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, these organizations need, need support, right? Like there's no, they're, they don't, they're not equipped uh, to build this technology on their own. Um, so while the ZKPs and st this, you know, it, it's very important to, for that, you know, for standards to, uh, to emerge and, and be ratified, um, you know, the, it's very complicated. Uh, and so, uh, providing, providing the middle, middleware layer, uh, to connect, uh, ERP systems, for example, re it requires, uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of intricate, uh, integration. Uh, and, you know, we're sort of automating that process and that, that requires a, you know, any, any good open source project, you know, is I, I'm against like sort of the open core model uh, of open source, but like, like, you know, I think commercial support, uh, you know, is, is, uh, uh, is still a thing, um, you know, and so, so there's, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, um, of opportunity and, and um, yeah, there's a ton of opportunity in the space right now. And, and what I'll add is we're, we're pure blue ocean strategy phase of this industry right now. So I, I mean, everything is too new and there's a massive open marketplace that even though you're seeing some standards being developed, you're seeing enterprises joining consortiums and, and you know, uh, these groups, it's still so early that there's so much opportunity. And really the way that we've been doing it is, you know, we're, we're building with, you know, in a kind of an architecturally sound way that we know can scale, but at the same time, we're just diving in. From a business perspective, we're diving in, trying to gobble up as much market share as we can. And then at some point, we'll sort out what's going on, right? And we'll, we'll think of what's working, what's not working. But right now, it doesn't matter. Right now, like there, there's only really maybe a dozen games in, in town that can actually participate in the ZKP side. We need to dive in. We need to just you know, race into the, the market and, and learn as we go. That's, that's entrepreneurship, okay? That's <laughs> textbook <laughs> definition of entrepreneurship. <laughs> Try not to over-intellectualize it too much, right? Exactly. I'm, I'm curious if any of you, you know, watched uh, uh, Vitalik's speech uh, at the FCC the, in Paris. He was talking a little bit about the future of the Ethereum blockchain. And a lot of it was coming down the road to things like snarks and then zero knowledge, Um you know, and it kind of sounded like after we get there, it feels like that is Ethereum kind of wrapped up, right? That's Ethereum that's, they can tap to the foundation can take a step back. And then perhaps people like you can move in and really just push the commercial side of it. Um, and, and it will kind of exist on its own after that. Uh, do you find yourselves following the, the decentralized space like Ethereum very closely? And, and I mean, did you watch that speech? Uh, was that something you were paying attention to? So I, I didn't, um, but, mm -hmm. you know, this is a really interesting point of um, decentralization. And I, I did just listen to it. Vitalik had a, a great um, 
Epicenter interview recently uh, where he was talking about the trade-offs on decentralization versus, you know, more centralized stuff. And, and what you get on the decentralized side is really kind of ruled by consensus, which I think is really important for slow moving processes, things that like you, you get a whole bunch of reasonable smart people together and they can all agree largely, you know, on, on some processes and, and changes that need to happen. That's a slow moving process. And, and, and I'm a believer that, you know, as, as um, core protocols become more mature, they need to get more slow moving. But we're still so early as an industry that you, you don't want to be slow moving, you know, too quickly. Because as soon as you do that, you're locking in a sort of stasis or kind of like capture by consensus. And consensus here could mean kind of um, a, a group of stakeholders that made sense 10 years ago that may not necessarily make sense for the technologies going 10 years from now. Right. So the, the way that we're, we're approaching this strategically is to, you know, recognize and, you know, and, and kind of move towards more decentralization and get different groups in, involved with things. And we have a foundation as well. Uh, and, and the foundation is really important to kind of look at like we're, we're reevaluating this deeply because of what Shapeshift just recently did by, you know, setting up, a, they're decentralizing their entire company. They set up a foundation. The foundation is set to dissolve once they've reached, you know, certain, you know, sufficient decentralization. I actually don't think that that's necessarily the best competitive posture because you could dissolve too quickly. And then all of a sudden your ecosystem is missing kind of a strong brand, this reputable, you know, the community trust and collects resources together, people together to you know, act collectively together in, in a rational way. On the other end of it, you know, the pure entrepreneurial end. You've got just rapid innovation, dive into things kind of like I, I was just joking about, you know, try not to think too much, just dive in. You've got that stuff and that works really well for like rapid discovery when you're in early phases of an industry and you're going to make a lot of mistakes. The key is to learn from them and to be able to adapt and keep moving on. I think there's a rational balance and that balance should probably start out more entrepreneurial. And then as the industry matures and protocols mature, it should really start tilting more towards the consensus, you know, decentralized, decentralized path. I don't know where we are as an industry. We're 10, 10 plus years in. I think it's still early days. I, I just wouldn't want to rush to, you know, um, stasis by consensus you know, too prematurely. Yeah, that's well said. I, I completely agree. It is very early and, and we are, we are still moving very quick, quickly. Okay. I just wanted to ask you one more question while, while we're out here. Uh, are there any other technologies out there besides Ethereum that are really, uh, really helping to push this CK uh, technology in the right direction? There are. I'm biased. It's a horizon, right? And because we're building a horizon, <laughs> obviously, right? <laughs> no, but there are, there are others. And there are initial players. Like, it's not necessarily protocols. I mean, you've got like Zcash, kind of the, the usual suspects in the cryptocurrency world. Um, you know, Ethereum, obviously, the, the Ethereum community is kind of hands down like the elephant in the room of just investing a tremendous amount of resources and human talent in the space. Um, there are others like Elios is a, a VC backed like A16Z venture or A16Z just invested in uh, Elios. They're a really promising startup that's focusing strictly on ZKPs, this, you know, starting board labs. Um, so there are very interesting players, not necessarily protocols per se, but companies that are, are starting up and you know, groups that are forming. Um, so the, the space, is, but the space is still really, really new, and of course, obviously, pay attention to Horizon. Yeah, I gave you one last chance to uh, to, to plug the Horizon Labs in there before the end of the episode. Pay attention like, to Horizon, right? <laughs> <Joking, joking. laughs> Kyle, anything to say on this on this subject? Um, no, I, I agree uh, with, with what Rob said, and and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah again, you know, very humble humble to be uh, to join you guys today and um, excited to, to collaborate moving forward. All right, Ethan, I'll leave it to you to wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to add? <laughs> nothing else, <laughs> nothing else. I, I think it's well discussed. Uh, but one thing is, uh, you know, uh, 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 zero knowledge proof technology, privacy computing technology will be used widely in almost all the IT systems, not just for crypto, so so uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, even for for uh, Vitalik, when he talk about the uh, Ethereum, I think as long as it's only focus on the crypto, it won't it won't really really bring that technology to next level and serve the entire mankind. So so that's mm -hmm. why I, I I truly truly believe uh, for pub, all the public chains think about this and 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 find some solution to serve 
traditional IT system, traditional business, not everything around crypto. Because you know, right now we are working with the, the Shenzhen Singapore project. Some technology on Singapore is deployed on on public chain. Then the Chinese company, even the banks, couldn't really use that because it's they think it's it's crazily expensive. <laughs> but mm-hmm. So, so, so that's there's always some gaps there. So, I, I think if we fix that, for example, there's some kind of decentralized public chain without crypto, just mm-hmm. just act like a, a centralized, specialized cloud services. Then, a some kind of bridge the crypto world with the traditional world. I, I think that's where really all the technology will move really, really, really fast because there will be so many money, traditional money to invest into. Mm-hmm. The- yeah, I think Vitalik, you know, he actually had a very similar thought process to you, Ifan. He actually was saying that, the you know, the DeFi is great, but it's not the end of what this technology should be. Like there's a lot of social aspects we could be focusing on. You know, it might not get you rich with yields, but uh, this is probably the direction the technology is headed. Well, I'd like to thank you all again for joining me and really holding my hand on this topic. Uh, it wasn't an easy one to understand, but you guys do a great job of explaining it. So I really hope in the future we'll have a chance to catch up and talk again. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, guys. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.